Welcome to this video on Plato's analogy of the cave. Probably one of the most important videos I've made so far. Um, please subscribe to my channel and also leave a comment. I'd be happy to respond to your comments and also be happy to make maybe a video. Now I will talk about the sort of the usual interpretation of the cave analogy and then I will move on to what's maybe really at work here and what, re what really is at stake. And I will first describe the cave analogy to you. And this is in the seventh book of Plato's Republic. And Socrates here tells um, his interlocutor about the cave when you, know, you are to imagine a cave where prisoners are captured, held in shackles from childhood onwards. And they are, they don't know that they're not free. They don't know that they are prisoners because what they do all day, their lives are just looking at what we would call today a screen. So they look at shadows passing them by, the shadows of a duck, a shadow of a house, a shadow of a tree. But they don't know that what they're looking at are shadows. What they think they're looking at is that they're looking at a real house, a real tree, a real duck, and they're passing by. And now Plato describes this in a way that all of a sudden someone is freed. All of a sudden someone is, for no reason given, very interestingly, is freed and can begin to walk up, walk towards the outside of the cave, walk towards the exit of the cave. Now, what the person sees while he's walking up there is he sees people who carry torches and he sees people who carry sort of uh, figures made of clay. So he, he, he would see a figure, a copy, effectively, of a duck, of a tree, of a house. And that's a very painful experience, as the way Plato describes it here. And that painful experience becomes even more, because it, it, all of a sudden there's something, you know, what what was reality sort of before is shattered on this path towards the outside world and on the way up it's becoming more and more painful uh, to realize that there's something very strange going on in this cave and once this person is outside it he's blinded by the light of the actual sun so no longer that flickering light of the the torches of the flames but now he actually sees the sun that's a blinding uh, almost a blinding experience it's very painful but then it'll take some time and actually it's very interesting that Plato uh, points out that it'll take the night it'll take you know the night night must come first and then first this person looks at the stars and then looks at the sun the next day and sort of gets used to looking at the real real things real beings a real tree and the sun itself is described of course as the ordering principle the idea of the good that's the only time that plato speaks of her idea in uh, the republic now this is usually um interpreted and by the way i should mention this also that the person who actually leaves the cave comes back down and faces death because the people who are down there in the cave they want to kill him if he goes back down they will want to kill him but he's going back down he faces them he stumbles and if he tells them about look out there that the real world is out there the truth is out there they will laugh at him and won't believe him because he's stumbling he can't really uh function as it were in this society and now, the usual interpretation would be, there are two interpretations. The first is, this is educational. It's about realizing that we're always already um, in shackles and we need to free ourselves and realize our full human potential. That's the, maybe the enlightenment uh, interpretation, you could say. And then, of course, the other more Platonic or Nietzschean interpretation is that Plato here introduces by way of a metaphor his um, theory of ideas right that there is there are in this world or his two world theory that in, in this world it's just 
shadows, nothing's real, uh, and the, the true world of eternal ideas. That, that's where we want to get to. Um, now, I don't think that Plato has a true world theory. I don't think that that's in any way accurate because it makes no sense. Plato doesn't speak of two cosmos. He doesn't speak of two worlds. He speaks of what we would say in English. Uh, he speaks of two realms that, that he does. He speaks of two different realms, but that's just different areas, right? So the usual interpretation is that these shadows, they're not real. What's really real is what's out there. But if the shadows aren't real, then why do these shadows make up that life world of the people down there in the cave? So that's the first thing that's very strange about this because these shadows are real. They're real for the people down there in the cave. They're real in the sofa as they structure the world and the experience of the prisoners who don't know that they're prisoners and who don't realize that what they're looking at is shadows. So in that sense, they're very real, they're very genuine. Um, and that kind of, th th that blindness comes, of course, because they lack a certain light. They lack the light of the sun. So the person who walks out, walks out and comes back down realizes these shadows as shadows, sees them as shadows, because he brings the light of the sun down with him. And that light, all of a sudden then lights up the shadows as what, as what they are. But they are. And that's the strange thing. They are. They are, but they're not really. So they are in a way that they are privative. There's, some, there's something lacking. And that's a very strange way of being, right? We, perhaps, perhaps we've seen this, that something is, but isn't quite. So something is, but you, you cannot quite put your finger on it, but it, it isn't, it doesn't feel real. Um, and it, it might be just as a side note that we live in an age that never quite knows whether something's real or not, because why, why would you have to call food real food if you weren't sure that it's actually real? So maybe perhaps there's something more to the, to Plato's case than we, that we allow ourselves to, to see. Um, and very interesting also that the people down there in the cave, they play a game. They play a status game of remembering and memorizing the correct order of the shadows that pass them by. And the one who can remember these shadows passing by correctly wins a prize. Now, that reminds maybe a few people of, of how we interact every day, where we just repeat what we saw on the news, we repeat what we read in a book that everybody reads, we repeat what we, uh, what we learned at school, we repeat what everybody else is saying, we repeat what, what you see on television and now people say, I don't watch television, I watch Netflix as if there were a difference, there isn't. Um, because because it, it's about just you know shadows passing us by and that, that's the other strange thing about film when you think about it. A film, that's just a seeming, it's a mere appearance. But that appearance can become very real. It, it actually can uh, inform how we how people act. And so so the standard story of just Plato trying to, to get his difficult theory of ideas across, I don't think that that's what's going on because very important, the word eidos and also the word idea in Greek that Plato uses, both of them actually meant what something looks like. And no one's you might not have heard this before because we usually think of idea as you know the mental the non-physical the metaphysical that that which is in a world beyond but for the greeks it's all about how something appears the question of parmenides the question of heraclitus the question of plato and aristotle is how do beings appear to us and how can we how can we know that they're real so it's ontology rather than also epistemology is an epistemology that needs an ontology so what um then so that that's maybe a, a more philosophical point on it but if we look at it in a historical way what's happening here it, it's it's once you wrap your head around this it's fascinating that we now live in a world of screens of i'm recording this looking at myself in a screen you will be looking 
you will be watching this on a screen and you will be guided in your way of thinking by what you hear me say, but also by maybe the, 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 the way I'm gesturing, right? But that's a mere appearance. It's, it's a mere shadow. But these shadows on TV screens that are abundant in our age, they're not unreal. They're real and they make the, the media, they, they, that's what they are. They mean, I don't mean the mainstream media or anything like that. I just mean medium media in that sense of a medium. They mediate to us what is, or at least what seems to be. And very often we do not question what we see. We are confronted with something. We take it, we take it just as it appears to us, but we don't question it. So that's one of the, the, the main things we can learn from the caves that we just take in, you know, in, immediately what's given to us or, or seems to be given rather than just asking what's actually at work in that very givenness. And now what seems to be at work in that cave is what the Greeks called Aletheia. That's their word, their beautiful word for truth. Aletheia, which means an unconcealing or disclosing or uncovering, discovering. Now, Aletheia is again a privative notion. Lethe is the river of forgetting in Hades. Um, Lantano, which is a verb, which is the root verb of, of that noun, means I forget. So truth for the Greeks is first of all disclosing and unconcealing. So there's no correspondence truth. The way that epistemologists and scientists today think of truth is either it's some object out there that we get closer and closer to, and so it's, it's objectively given, but we just need to find it. And what I'm saying now has, not, has got nothing to do with sort of a postmodern relativism. It's got nothing to do with that. It's the question rather in Aletheia is, in order to find any epistemological truth at all, how we usually think of truth, there must be something disclosed to us in the first place. The world must be there in the first place. And then, however, we must wrest from that world what's real and what's, what's genuine and what's just an appearance and just a seeming. And they're not perfectly divided. They're always intermingling and interwoven. And that's what makes it so difficult. And I think that, for example, modern epistemology very much neglects all of that because for them, truth is just, you know, it's a justified true belief, which is, um, which was a joke by the guy who invented it anyways, but also a justified true belief uh, just works on correspondence truth. So what you think your representation is must correspond to the object out there. And if that's the case, then you have found true knowledge. But how do we, how do we get even to that correspondence? That's the question. Then there is something else at work and that's Aletheia itself. And the cave describes that. The people who are in the cave as prisoners, they look at the screen and they take it to be reality. They look at it and they never see the shadows as shadows. So there's already concealment at work. But once someone walks out, once someone begins to exit, there are moments of disclosure on the way up, moments of disclosure further and further up and further and further true to truth itself, which is light. But that moment of disclosure, and I here I follow Heidegger's interpretation of Plato's cave. What Heidegger points out here is that what Plato forgot or begins to forget to no fault of his own. So it's not, he's not, it's not about blaming Plato or anything. It's not Plato is not, Plato responded to a, to a, to an historical moment that where he tried to understand what really is and what just, what is just, what is just a seeming in a, in an appearance. And he tried to be responded to it with, for example, the cave. But once you're outside and you look at the sun and you go back in, it's very interesting that 
this unconcealment sort of is followed by a concealment. It, it's followed by a necessary returning into the cave. But what Heidegger argues is that Plato forgets about the original concealments, as it were, and that through the millennia, through the eons, our history in the West, our way of thinking becomes fixated on an available presence of the sun so that there is a presence without concealment. And that very much is the age we live in. That very much is the technological age. We live in the age of availability of everything that was ever produced and it's available for everyone at any time, anywhere, regardless of where you are, where you are, your place doesn't matter. The time doesn't matter. It's all just there. You can access it. You don't need to suffer through what Nietzsche thought. You can just access a Wikipedia page and it'll tell you everything about him and his philosophy. And it, 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 will, it will never be an experience, an original experience of thinking. It'll always just be a shallow, not even a copy. It's very difficult to, 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 to it's a format of, of thought with a very strange way of actually thinking about it when you, when you start sort of thinking in this way. And now, but it's very interesting that idea, I think, in Eidos used to mean what something looks like and we now think of it as metaphysical. So with, in this moment of, of Western history, for Heidegger it's clear this is where it begins not to go wrong, because that would be a moral statement, but where it begins to withdraw, where a certain aspect of truth itself begins to withdraw, and that is withdrawal itself. That's absence, that's non-presence, non-availability, and that's something that Heidegger thinks we must absolutely now begin to think. That's concealment itself. We must begin to realize that whatever we find, whatever scientific discovery we make, that there's actually something not there, not showing itself, that perhaps even anything we've found so far in nature and often about nature might just be that she, she might never actually show herself in truth. Um, and we, we don't, we, we would never think like that. We think that science is accumulative. Whatever we find brings us closer to objective truth. Um, and, but to, to, to bring this back to the cave, it might just be that all we deal with is shadows in so far as we are so trapped in a, in an availability of presence that we never actually ask what is at work in that presence. Is there anything that's not showing itself? When we go a bit beyond uh, uh, Plato, th there's another book I, I wanted to mention, which is um, The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster, who is a, a British author, an English author. Uh, it's, a, it's a very strange novel from, I think, 19... 1911 or so, I'm not quite sure about when it was written, but it describes a world where people live underground and earth, life on earth for some reason is no longer possible or is we don't do it anymore. And people live underground and they, you know, they're still biological parents and everything, but you, you're not really in touch with your children. You're not really in touch with anyone. You just live in your cell. And he describes tablets. This is more than a hundred years ago. And he, he describes what we would now call iPads, right? Or literally tablets that we use to uh, surf online and that we use for Skype. He describes what we, now, we would now call Skype or, or online, uh, uh, you know, Google Hangout, etc. Um, these tools that we use in order to have video uh, conferences with, with others. And what people talk about is purely intellectual. So they, they talk about ideas and they want to get ideas. They want to download ideas into their, onto their uh, tablets so they can use those ideas to write more papers and memos about the great world, but they're never actually outside. 
they never actually outside the machine stops at some point and they they are freed uh, and, and they see the earth but I think what the cave teaches us or at least warns us about is that perhaps there is no exit perhaps all there really is is the cave why does Plato make the philosopher king the freed person why does he make him why would he have to return why maybe because there simply is no exit but then the question becomes another question so the question is and you know is, is there an exit like a, a door that I just walk through and I'm outside and I, I'm in truth and that's just a state I enter maybe then the question is another the que because the question ultimately is about freedom right if that what's described is our prisoners and someone who's free so the story of the cave is about gay reaching achieving freedom which has got nothing to do with free will and all this other nonsense so gaining freedom how perhaps by appreciating that sometimes we have to accept a certain unfreedom and that freedom comes about in the way we respond to what it means to try what it, what it means to try and find what really is and what isn't that's where freedom happens and that's where truth happens and i think that is what the cave ultimately tells us so thank you very much for watching please subscribe to the channel uh, please leave a comment and please spread the word thank you very much